Hello, everyone. My name is Rebecca Morton. My pronouns are she, her. I'm the artist and studio manager here at Baltimore Playworks. We are thrilled that you all have joined us. I would like to acknowledge that I'm joining from my office located on Biscataway and Susquehannock land, currently known as Baltimore Playworks. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our virtual artist talk given today by David McDonald. He will be giving a two day demonstration only workshop on April 13th and 14th. And there are a few spots left, so be sure to sign up soon. A native of New Jersey, Professor David McDonald received his Bachelor's of Arts degree in art education from Hampton University, where he studied under the noted African-American ceramic artist, Joseph Gilliard. He earned his Master of Fine Arts degree from the University of Michigan, where he studied under noted African-American ceramic artist, Robert Stoll. After receiving his Master of Fine Arts degree in 1971, he joined the faculty of the School of Art and Design at Syracuse University. Professor David McDonald's creative work is mostly inspired by his investigation of his African heritage, looking at a variety of design sources and the vast creative traditions of the African continent. Professor McDonald draws much of his inspiration from the myriad examples of surface decoration that are manifested in the many ethnic groups of sub-Saharan Africa, such as pottery decoration, tes textiles, body decoration, and architectural decor decoration. Professor McDonald's work is represented in many public and private collections throughout the nation. His work has also been featured in several ceramic textbooks and magazines, and he has been featured in several nationally televised TV programs, such as HGTV's Modern Masters and PBS's Craftsman's Legacy. After retiring from Syracuse University in 2008, he was awarded emeritus professor status, and in 2011, he was given the Excellent in Teaching Award from the National Conference for Ceramic for the Education and the Ceramic Arts. At Syracuse University commencement in 2022, Professor McDonald was awarded an honorary doctorate of fine arts. Since his retirement, he has been active lecturing across the country, volunteering in his community and working in the studio. For more information about our artist talks, please visit our virtual library at baltimoreclayworks.org. And I will now turn it over to David. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for taking time out of your uh, busy afternoon to spend some time with me boring you to death with uh, uh, my experiences in clay. I want to thank uh, the Baltimore Clay Works for uh, allowing this to happen, and I really am looking forward to uh, the weekend I'm going to spend in, uh, down there uh, demonstrating some of the techniques that I use. Um, one of the difficulties in uh, doing uh, a slide presentation like this is that it's impossible to try to adequately uh, condense a, a lifetime's work in clay into an hour or so presentation. I've been working in clay for about 61 years, and during that time, I've made a lot of stuff and made a lot of mistakes, but also had uh, a fair number of successes as well. And one of the difficulties is that as you... Uh, continue to work, you make more work that you want to share with people. And as a result of that, uh, what happens is that some some pieces, some of the early pieces, some of the early ideas have to be bumped off of the uh, slide presentation in order for it to be within a reasonable uh, length of time. Um, the presentation is going to start with um, somewhat chronological sequence of, of events, and then uh, it's going to uh, uh, be a consisting primarily of uh, a survey of some ideas that I've been working with in the past. Uh, and in, in some instances, it may seem somewhat disorganized because I'll work on a particular idea for a couple of years, and then after about five or six years, go back to it with some new ideas. And so uh, what I want to show you is just 
a few examples of the various ideas that I've been working with in terms of uh, my ceramics. So, okay, so this is a photograph that was taken many years ago when uh, uh, me and four of my siblings were posing for a family photo. I'm the third oldest in the family of nine children, uh, eight boys and one girl. And my father always complained that that one girl ruined a perfectly good baseball team. But at any rate, uh, she uh, wound up being the toughest one of the group. I'm the, uh, the one in the upper left corner with the kind of cheese-eating grin um, in my uh, Gene Autry uh, shirt, which Gene Autry was a... Uh, um, a movie hero back during that time, uh, he was the king of the cowboys. And so uh, my mother, in order for us to be dressed for uh, this special photograph, she bought these shirts for us. I grew up in the public housing in Hackensack, New Jersey, the northern, uh, northern northeastern corner of New Jersey at right across the uh, Hudson River, as a matter of fact, from the third floor of this building, I could see uh, the very top of the Empire State Building. Uh, and, and each of this was a complex of eight buildings, and each building kind of acted like a, a village, you know, uh, and everybody looked out for everyone. And if you were seen doing something you weren't supposed to be doing, that news would get home before you and you would have hell to pay. All right, this is a photograph of me in, uh, in my high school uh, yearbook. I ran track and cross country in ha at Hackensack High School and that enabled me to get an athletic scholarship to uh, Hampton Institute at the time, now is Hampton University. Uh, this was, I graduated from high school in 1963, and this was around the time when the civil rights movement in uh, the South uh, was starting to heat up, and there were a lot of demonstrations, some of them violent, uh, and this is one example of that. And during this time, uh, most young people people's lives is when you go away to college and you're on your own for a significant period of time and you start to think about uh, what's important to you and 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 uh, and starting to develop your own attitudes. Uh, you, when you're younger, you believe what your parents believe. As you get older, you start to uh, exercise some individuality. And during that period for me was when the civil rights movement really started heating up. This is Joseph Gilliard. Uh, he was my professor at Hampton Institute. Uh, he was an incredibly uh, knowledgeable and talented and patient uh, professor. He loved to test glazes. He often said that the only reason he makes pots was to have a surface to test his glazes on. Uh, just recently at the last in Sika in Richmond, Virginia, I was honored uh, to be asked to receive a posthumous award uh, from Mr. Gilead in terms of lifetime achievement uh, for his family. Uh, and he uh, was a very important part of, of my life in terms of my developing a love for ceramics, both the aesthetic and the technical side of it as well. This is a photograph of Mr. Gilliard uh, later on in life. Uh, after he retired, uh, he became the Southern gentleman. Uh, these are the kinds of things that I was making by the time I reached my senior year in, in undergraduate school. Uh, my work was about uh, the civil rights movement, the predicament of the African American in uh, this supposedly a uh, democratic society. After graduating from uh, Hampton, I uh, I uh, was enrolled at the University of uh, Michigan, 
And I studied with uh, another African American ceramic artist by the name of Robert Stull. Now, back at back during that time, the number of of African American professors in ceramics that were teaching at uh, major universities in the United States, you could probably count on one hand. And simply by luck, I was able to study with two of, two of them. Mr. Gilliard gave me a. Uh, uh, a strong technical background in clay. In clay. Uh, Robert Stell helped me to develop my aesthetics and encouraged me to to look uh, at my African heritage as a source of inspiration. And this is one of the pieces that I made during my uh, final year at Michigan. It's uh, an American flag that's kind of exuding these tortured babies. Uh, my work at Michigan was still involved in social commentary. This is uh, a, a piece called uh, A Roach Eyes View. Uh, using a variety of, of materials, uh, including uh, lusters and ceramic decals that I made myself and uh, flocking or that fuzzy stuff you see on Christmas cards. This is one of the pieces from my senior show is called uh, American. Um, I mean, violence is as American as mom's apple pie. Uh, it's a quote from uh, a remark by one of the Black Panthers that uh, uh, responded to a, a criticism by some politician that uh, the Black Panthers said that they were willing to defend their neighborhood even if it resulted in violence. And this politician remarked that he was appalled that this organization was advocating violence. And, and their response was, well, violence is as American as mom's apple pie, uh, which, is, which is the case if you look at the history uh, of America, you know, you uh, many of of the advancements and the the gains were uh, achieved through violence uh, as well. This was uh, a plate that I made uh, also during my uh, final year at the University of Michigan. It was uh, it was entitled um, uh, "Homage to a Victim." And it is a photograph, a ceramic decal photograph of a child in uh, uh, that was a victim of the Biafran uh, Nigerian Civil War. And one of the things that uh, that to me it it symbolizes is the uh, there's a, a a, a very old African saying that when elephants fight, it, it is the grass that suffers. And uh, in this particular case, when adults disagree and decide to settle their differences with violence, it's usually the innocents, people, uh, the children, uh, the women that suffered the most. This is what I looked like when I joined the faculty at. Uh, Syracuse University, I was uh, an angry young black man, and I actually was surprised that they hired me, but the ceramics studio was about two miles off the main campus, so they figured that I'd be safe out there. Uh, and so my work was still about being angry uh, about uh, the, the predicament of um, the African American in in this culture. And I had an exhibition, a, a, a one-man show in Syracuse at a small community gallery. And uh, during the opening reception, at the end of the opening reception, uh, uh, an elderly white lady approached me and, and we conversed for a while. And then she asked me if uh, she could ask me a question. And, and I, uh, agreed, and she asked me um, if there was anything 
good about being a black man in America or being a black person in, in, in America. I don't recall my response to that query, but it probably was a question that changed my direction and my attitude towards my work more than the hundreds of hours of critiques that I sat through. And so that series that was originally based on being angry uh, changed into one in which I started investigating uh, my African heritage, uh, um, remembering conversations that I had with Professor Stahl in terms of uh, Africa uh, being um, a country or, or a continent that that had civilizations and universities uh, long before Europe, while Europeans, many of them were still living in caves. And so I started investigating more African, more about African uh, culture and African history, which wasn't part of my education uh, going through high school or even college. And what I started looking at, which became uh, a logical point of entry for me into this foreign culture was uh, utilitarian uh, uh, objects that were produced by African cultures. And this is an example of a ceremonial drinking vessel uh, from uh, Nigeria. And then this is, is an Ibu, which is also Nigerian uh, water vessel. And one of the things that I, I enjoyed about looking at all of these African uh, pots was the way in which they decorated their surfaces. And one of the things I came to realize um, later on was that um, a lot of times I just make pots so that I have a surface to decorate pretty much the same way that Mr. Gilliard only made pots in order to test his glazes on. And so I started uh, investigating ways of trying to get the same kinds of patterns, and I developed a tool that allowed me to do that. And it's just a simple tool. It's a piece of ebony with a notch cut in the end of it. And a lot of the decoration that I do uh, uh, is done during the Leatherheart stage. I just think the Leatherheart stage is probably the best stage for me to decorate because the surface is still soft and sympathetic, but the form is much more rigid. Uh, and so developing that tool and try to, trying to echo some of the things I enjoyed about that Nigerian, that Ibu water pot, water jar, uh, I started incorporating that carving technique into some of my utilitarian work. I should say that that the thing that fascinated me the most about clay uh, was the fact that you could take this material that has no intrinsic value and turn it into something that's beautiful. But even more so for me, the, 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 the miracle of ceramics is to be able to make something that has utility, something that can be used. Mr. Gilead often talked about the artist uh, having the responsibility of contributing to a culture and that he didn't believe in the, the notion of art for art's sake, but art for man's sake. And so the notion of utility for me in ceramics fit right into it. And, and I just could not believe that you could take this lump of dirt and turn it into something Useful. So these are some examples of some of the early uh, casserole type forms. I hesitate to call them casserole because I really don't recommend people putting them in the oven, but they're kind of covered serving vessels, and that's the form that they take. Uh, at the University of Michigan, uh, I, uh, from Professor Stahl, I learned how, how to throw large plates. And he had... He had done a uh, a Fulbright scholarship in Japan where he learned this uh, Japanese throwing technique, which is actually 
he he believed was actually from Korea using a throwing model. And this is one of the techniques I'm going, going to demonstrate during my demonstration uh, at the Baltimore Clay Works. But it opened up uh, a world of possibilities for me. Um, one of the things I discovered once I started making these large plates that everybody liked them, but no one purchased them. And I mentioned this to Professor uh, Stalin. He said that that uh, the problem is is that people don't always have enough horizontal space in, in in their living arrangements to accommodate a plate like that. So why don't you design them to hang on the wall? And so that's what I I did. Uh, and so they hang on the wall. Uh, this is a shot of, of the backside of one. They hang hang on the wall like a plate like a, uh, a painting and as a result of that it changed my attitude towards them in a number of of uh, ways that i only suddenly became aware of one of the one of the things was that that when you hang something on the wall you have to determine what's up and what's down uh whereas on a horizontal surface that's not uh an important concern and once i started thinking about these things as hanging on the wall then i started thinking them more as drawings uh uh, and then as uh three-dimensional objects and so i started investigating a lot of different decorative techniques from Africa. And this is uh, a symbol from uh, a textile tradition in Ghana called the Adinkra uh, tradition. And in the Adinkra tradition, textile tradition, they have a, a whole plethora of, of symbols and each symbol means a certain, had, has a certain meaning. This particular one is called the knot of reconciliation. It's a symbol of reconciliation, peacemaking, and pacification. And I enjoyed the, the way the uh, pattern occupied space and the way that it kind of doubled back on, on itself. And so I started using it uh, on my plates as well as a central image. And I enjoyed it so much that I actually wound up using it as a symbol on my business cards as well. And these are some uh, variations on the use of that uh, that particular symbol from the Adinkra tradition. And so I also started looking at uh, African architecture as well. I, I was originally introduced it into it uh, when uh, uh, looking at a book that was given to me by a student as a present, as a present uh, of, of the Indebelli people of South Africa. And then I happened upon a book uh, in Barnes and Nobles that also had to deal with, uh, with uh, African mules and uh, the African architectural decoration. And so I started looking a lot at uh, looking at that as a source of, of pattern and idea. And in many ways, my work is very, very formal in terms of relying upon symmetry and, and such kinds of formal concerns, uh, as well as looking at, um, at uh, African and pre-industrial uh, uh, cultures in terms of the, the uh, decorative uh, traditions they have. And this is uh, an example of an architectural um, uh, facade from East Africa. And this is another image from uh, the same book. And these are the, the Indebelli people, um, which are noted for their, their uh, unusual costumes and their neck rings as well and and but for me I, what i found interesting about them is the architectural uh decoration that they do that the women do uh on on their dwellings uh i discovered that in in many parts of africa 
uh, architectural decoration is done by women because it's considered to be uh, one of the domestic chores that women do. This is a, a, a hand-built earth, uh, a pit fired piece that I did that was inspired by the neck rings of the Indebelly women. Uh, scarification is, is one of the other uh, cultural traditions that uh, inspired a series of work. Um, one of one of the examples of, of that particular idea were the ceremonial uh, bowls that I made, which stand about three feet tall, uh, and and the pit fired earthenware with with a terra cigarata, um slip applied to them. But the surfaces are decorated using a slip trailing technique, which to me kind of uh, emulated the uh, scarification patterns that we saw in, in the previous slide. And then another example of architectural decoration, the Indebelly, uh, a very good example of the Indebelly uh, architectural decorations. And this is an Indebelly woman in the process of uh, decorating and that also inspired uh, the African mirror also inspired a series of earthenware plates, which are about 18 inches in diameter that I did, uh, that I called the uh, African mural series. And this is an example, and this is also an example of that, that idea as well. And then a further investiga investigation into um, African culture, I read across this book, uh, The People of, of Kao, uh, and um, one of the examples of body decoration that the men do during uh, a ceremony, um, a mating ceremony, where they're, I guess, making themselves more attractive to the women, this particular technique reminded me of a technique that we use in ceramics all the time, and it's called sgraffito. And so it, it inspired uh, the, uh, the series of pieces that uh, a cylinder is thrown and then a slip is applied to the surface of the cylinder uh, then a, a pattern is graffitoed using um, either a rib or a, a stick or something like that. And then the cylinder is expanded out into a, uh, a bulbous shape. Uh, the patterning at the top was, during, was done later on during the leather heart stage with slip trailing. And this is another example of uh, what I call the Maasai uh, series. I also was inspired by African hairdos or hairdresses, uh, and that inspired uh, a number of pieces, these being um, some examples of them where um, the upper part is supposed to be reminiscent of, uh, of uh, some kind of hair, hair uh, style, or here, a structure. These are all vessels, they're lids. Uh, and so that whole area up at the top, that whole, um, those wings up up the top actually lift off as a, a lid. And these are, this is called the uh, Nayama series. And Nayama is a uh, Swahili word that um, means the, the essential life force and i guess in west western culture it, it would be uh a word soul or spirit and i worked on this series for about five or six years uh, going back to it each time that i had a new idea and these are some of the later ones of that series so the central part of the form is wheel thrown, and then the wings and the fins are added on as slabs. Uh, this is an example of me working on one of the later ones, and they got particularly large. Uh, and this is that same piece finished. Uh, 
covered vessels are, are also ideas that I'd like to work with as well. Uh, uh, and, and just the idea of figuring out how I want the lid to relate to the vessel itself, whether I want the lid to be in the vessel or on the vessel, uh, is always an interesting challenge as well. As a matter of fact, I'm doing uh, I'm doing uh, three three workshops this summer, all of which are, are centered around the idea of making uh, lidded vessels, and I'll talk about those later on. But these are some examples of of some stoneware uh, covered jars, uh, storage jars that I I've, I've made as well. They range in size from about 12 inches in, in height. Uh, well, these are actually shorter. These are more like seven or eight up to uh, several feet. One of the things, uh, one of the sources of ideas that I've used recently is the idea of textiles and uh, quilting. My wife was a quilter, and I would often look through some of uh, her books on quilting patterns and see how I could incorporate those into uh, my work as well. These are some small porcelain covered jars, um, probably maximum height would probably be about seven, six or seven inches in height. And some different ways of uh, of trying to uh, de decorate the surface. One of the things I'm interested in is how the surface decoration affects the perception of the form and how the form occupies space. And sometimes how surface decoration creates this kind of illusion of, uh, of the surface undulating when in, in fact it's not. And this is a example of one of the later uh, covered jars. Um, this one was, it's probably about 12, 13 inches in height. And then when I'm interested in, in uh, working with color, which I don't always feel comfortable doing, but occasionally I force myself to do it. I, I usually work in the earthenware range. And so this is a series of earthenware uh, covered jars, uh, the carving, uh, the using a technique of scrofito and carving and slip trailing. Now, yeah, there was a series of forms that I started uh, working on probably around 1985 or 86. were based on uh, the uh, calabash gourd shape, which I saw in a number of books that I was looking at in terms of African culture, especially the Maasai people use the, the uh, calabash gourd as a as a traditional vessel to hold the water and the milk from from the cattle. And so I liked the shape of the calabash, and so I started doing a series of uh, vases. I guess this one is probably about 28, 29 inches tall. This one here, a variation on that same idea, uh, is probably about 23, 24 inches. And this is probably about the same size. So it's just uh, a variation of the, the double-lobed shape, uh, which I go back to from time to time. And this is this is another example of a symbol from the uh Adinkra uh textile tradition. Uh and this is an example of me uh trying to use a similar kind of shape on one of the calabash vases uh as well. And then uh, the calabash 
And this is probably the latest, the latest calabash vase that I've made, and it's probably about three feet tall. No, well, actually, it's not because these smaller ones are are the most recent. And then there was a series of forms that I, I, a series of pieces I made during the, I guess probably the mid 70s to early 80s uh, called the Middle Passage series. And it was uh, a series based on the transatlantic slave trade. And um, one of the uh, difficulties of, of thinking about the transatlantic slave trade was the fact that, in fact, it was probably, uh, there's an estimate of, of maybe 12 million uh, slaves were transported from Africa to the various parts of uh, the New World, the South America, the Caribbean, and, and, and the United States. Uh, so it was a horrific economical commercial adventure. Uh, but by the same token, if it hadn't happened, I wouldn't be where I am. And so I wanted the uh, series to be a testament uh, to the, the tragedy of the uh, transatlantic slave trade, but also to the resilience and the determination of the human spirit of those slaves that were traded to the United States in their ability to survive and to actually thrive. And so that's what this series is about. Uh, the nobility of the human spirit and, um, and uh, regardless of what it's been exposed to or or made to endure. And that's a close-up detail of one, one of the pieces. Then back to the plates where I started organizing the space of the plates in, in a variety of ways. Um, when I first started carving plates, I would carve the same pattern all the way from from border to border, from edge to edge. And then I started breaking up the space of the plates into a central image and then uh, an, a border image that goes around that. And so these are some examples of uh, a more recent, by more recent, I mean probably uh, 2014-15. In, in the center of this uh, is an example of when I started incorporating some of uh, 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 quilt patterns uh, in my, uh, on my plates as well, using uh, wax resist instead of carving. And this is another example of a quilt pattern, um, part of the quilt series. And then it's the same, the same pattern, but articulated using glaze and resist. This is actually, this is the same pattern, but articulated differently so that you, it, it, it creates this kind of tessellated uh, pattern. And then here again, uh, trying to use the idea of the quilt, the grid, the, in this particular case, instead of right angle grid, this uh, diagonal grid, but using that as a structure and then breaking it up into smaller parts using wax resist and glaze as a detail of the surface. And then a strongly gridded pattern. And these ideas were taken from uh, uh, the African uh, tradition of mud cloth. And this is an example, this is an actual example of a, a, a Zulu ceremonial shield. And one of the things, I did, it was 
given to me as a gift by one of uh, one of my friends who has been who, who has been collecting my work for a number of years, and and he gave it to me as a gift because he he thought it reminded him of my plates. But one of the things I enjoy about this is that the way in the different way in which they're breaking up that circular space. And so that inspired a series of uh, plates. And these are some more examples of, of Indibelli shields. And that inspired the series of uh, plates I call my Zulu series, in which I try to get away from the grid and figure out different ways of configuring that circular space. And these are maybe about 18 to 20 inches in diameter. They're all high-fired stoneware. I fire to about cone 11. Uh, this is an example, one example of mud cloth uh, from West, West Africa. And here again is a raffia cloth. And you can see the strong um, grid pattern that uh, is the structure that these um, textiles are built upon, these designs are built upon. And so they inspired a series of porcelain plates about 15 inches in diameter in which I coated the surface of the plate with a, a vitreous black on gold and then carved through it using the sclafito technique to try to keep create this black, this white on black uh, kind of pattern. And then uh, another example of using that same kind of grid pattern from the textiles as well. All of these are porcelain plates, like I said, uh, about 14, 15 inches in diameter. Then there's a series that I've, I've been working on uh, probably for the last seven or eight years called the uh, 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 figurative vessels. And they're based upon my projection of the female figure. Um, and it was inspired by uh, uh, an instance um, I, during the time when I was uh, teaching, I had stepped, I had run some errands during the lunch hour and I uh, stopped to get a slice of pizza at a local pizzeria and was sitting there in, in my truck eating the slice of pizza facing the street. It was uh, a typical Syracuse winter day, uh, overcast and windy and just gray. But I saw out the corner of my eye this mass of color moving uh, towards me. And I glanced over and, and it was a, a group of young, uh, I assume Sudanese uh, refugee women that were having just a ball walking. I don't know where, where they were going, but they were wearing their traditional uh, 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 clothing. And as I said, it was a slightly windy day, and so the wind was rustling their fabric, and it was just, just this very active mass of color moving towards me, and that inspired this series. And so, uh, symbolically, uh, the, the bottom part of these forms is decorated using some kind of textile pattern, in this particular case, a pattern that I used on the calabashes uh, representing uh, uh, textiles or, or dress or some kind of skirt. And the covered jars as well. And this is, to give you an idea of the scale of some of them, it's me working on, the, on this particular one as well. And then these are a, a group of them that were in process. And these are some of, of the finished ones. I really got interested in making the knobs, the lids, you know, more interesting and, and more involved as well. But it, this is a detail 
the surface is carved and uh, a white on gold is applied, and then a, 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 a couple of layers of glaze were applied on top of that. So these are just some examples of that figurative jar. Uh, oh. Right. And th these are some images of uh, another style of mud cloth, which is much more colorful. There's a style of mud cloth, um, the textiles that is basically black and white, which I find to be very powerful. But then there's also another tradition in, in the mud cloth uh, textile tradition where they use a lot of bright colors. And that inspired here again. Uh, translating that into the figurative va uh, a vessel uh, format, where using those patterns at the bottom of, of the form to uh, create the idea of a dress or, or textiles. Uh, the, the lids became more involved uh, to mimic, once again, African hairdos. And this is a detail, also used uh, acrylic paint in some places and and uh, an actual cowrie shells. This is another example from that series. And the patterns were done during the Leatherhurst days using a combination of on gold and underglaze colors. What got me interested in ceramics was the idea, as I mentioned earlier, that you could make things that people could actually use. I, I grew up in public housing. Dad didn't have a workshop in the basement or out in the garage where, you, where he made things. Anything that you needed or wanted um came from a factory some distance away and you just went to a store to buy it so the idea that i could take this material and actually make something that i could use was i was initially skeptical and then i was just completely fascinated by it. and so the, the production of, of functional utilitarian objects has always been and will continue to be a fairly large part of my annual production. And so these are just some examples, some current examples of drinking vessels that I've been working on, trying to translate some of those uh, uh, textile patterns into the surface. These are porcelain carving. The bowl is probably my most favorite shape to throw. Uh, some people may think of the bowl as being a fairly simple shape, but the uh, seemingly infinite variety of different kinds of shapes and characters and the way in which the bowl occupies space and its absolute utilita utilitarianism is, is, has always fascinated me. And so I, um, during the course of my production every year, I usually wind up making hundreds of bowls just as a way, especially if I'm cutting off a period in which I've been intensely involved in making larger scale pieces, just getting back into uh, a scale that I feel is more comfortable for me and and I can explore ideas more quickly. Uh, the bowl is that place where I go. And so these are just some variations on on the idea of the bowl and surface decoration. Then once again, the casserole form. Uh, and these are some examples of my more uh, recent casseroles with a serving dish. Um, one of the things I've always uh, wondered about uh, if you're using a casserole or you can use this as a soup terrine, where do you put the spoon when you're done using it. And so I decided to make a series of small plates that that actually the vessel sits in the middle of. And so when you're done using, you can put the spoon on the plate without 
soiling the, the uh, tablecloth. Uh, I was asked by uh, the International Museum of Dinnerware in Michigan to participate in a project uh, that they had a number of years ago where they uh, commissioned uh, a group of artists to make a ceramic object based upon a particular uh, theme. And the first uh, theme that they uh, presented was butter. And I had never made a butter dish. And so I found, I found it interesting. And this is an earthenware, is earthenware because I wanted it to be colorful. Uh, and so this is one variation on that butter dish. And this is another one that I did as well as a variation on the butter dish. Then the next, a couple of years later, the next uh, theme that they presented was the idea of breakfast. And for me, breakfast always meant bacon. Uh, I remember uh, waking up on uh, Saturday morning or Sunday morning to the smell of, of bacon. And so I decided to make a couple of, of, uh, of dishes, covered dishes that were designed to hold bacon. And so these are examples of them. Earthenware, using basic decorating techniques, graffito, uh, slip trailing. And this is my home. This is where I live, 113 Clare Road, Syracuse, New York. Uh, feel free to visit any time you happen to be in the area, but hopefully you won't come on a day like this. Uh, maybe more on a day like this. Uh, this is my studio, which is behind my house. This is the end of uh, my work area. Uh, it's about the size, the studio is about the size of a three-car garage, um, and it has a second floor where my office is. And so this is the workspace. These are some examples. Uh, you, my, my studio practice, I guess, is, is the term they use, is I, if I'm working on some ideas for plates, I usually throw um, in, in, anywhere from 10 to a dozen plates at one time, get them to the leather hard stage tooled and wrapped in plastic, and then I go back and decorate. And these are some examples of some of the functional way I was doing. I had this project that I started in Syracuse uh, called the 100 Bowl Project. And what I do is I pick a community organization, and it has to be a 501c3, and I throw 100 bowls, small bowls, um, uh, starting out with no more than about a pound and a half or two pounds of clay. And I sign the bowls, and I give the bowls to this organization to sell for $50 each. And they are allowed to keep all the proceeds, but any bowls that aren't sold during that one event are returned to me, and, and I use them to augment the next 100 bowl uh, project. And so I, I've been able to do two of them so far. I've got two scheduled for this year. I think I want to uh, do one a year because it is getting to be a bit much. but. That's my way of giving back to a community that's been so supportive of my creative efforts. Okay. This is a photograph of my family, my youngest son, which is, to give you an idea of how old this photograph is, to my youngest son, who's in the upper left-hand corner, he now is 47. So this should give you an idea that this is an old photograph. Uh, this is my wife. Uh, we were we dated in undergraduate school. We married during our senior year at Hampton, and uh, we she passed away and the day before Mother's Day 
in uh, 2022, we were married, and I feel we're still married, but at that time, we have been married for 55 years. She was a wonderful person, and I was very lucky to be partnered with her for a lifetime. And this is me working on the form that I enjoy the most, the bowl, and, and just uh, having fun. <laughs> 